The NFL season is finally here, so make sure you're ready with NFL Sunday Ticket and YouTube TV. It gives you the most live NFL games all in one place, exactly what you need to make your Sundays more magical. Sign up today at youtube.com slash Sunday Ticket. Local and national games on YouTube TV, NFL Sunday Ticket for out-of-market games excludes digital-only games. It's been a three-year wait, but the Olympics are back, and the CBS Sports Podcast Network has you covered with everything happening in Paris. It's a new era for the U.S. women's national team, and attacking third will tackle all the women's soccer action. First Cut will keep close tabs on golf, while Beyond the Arc will follow the U.S. men's basketball team on a quest for another gold. And We Need to Talk Now will provide comprehensive coverage of women's athletes at the Olympic Games. Follow and listen to all CBS Sports podcasts for free on the Odyssey app and wherever you get your podcasts. The Moth Podcast shares incredible true stories told live. And for our next episode, we're going for gold. As I made my way around the track with my American teammates in a crowd of 100,000 people, as if they were the only ones in the stadium, I saw my parents. Three stories all about the Olympics. This special episode's available right now. Subscribe to the Moth Podcast to make sure you hear it. It's the middle of the summer in 1965 on Bainbridge Island in Washington State. State legislator Joel Pritchard and his friend Bill Bell have just returned to Joel's summer home after a round of golf, only to find their families lounging around, bored out of their minds. Summer is supposed to be, you know, fun and relaxing, but today everyone's complaining that there's just nothing to do. Joel reminisces about his own childhood, a time when kids would invent their own games to pass the time. And inspired by this memory, he decides to create a new game on the spot. The house has an old badminton court, so Bill and Joel start rummaging around for some equipment. They can't find all the badminton rackets, so they improvise. As the story goes, Joel grabs some ping pong paddles and a wiffle ball, you know, one of those plastic balls with holes in it that we all play with in grade school gym. He and Bill gather the kids and head to the old badminton court. They start hitting the ball around, making the game up as they go. Sometimes they play one-on-one, other times they play on teams of two. Either way, the game feels, so far, a lot like the other racket sports, especially since the families are inspired by badminton. One person serves the ball, and it sails over the net. From there, the teams take turns hitting the ball back and forth and trying to get the other out. Now, the rules for winning and losing are no doubt premature, but it's safe to say that things like hitting a ball out of bounds or into the net is a loss, like in badminton. Bill's son would later recount, I was the ripe age of five years old. There was a lot of commotion on this court all day, every day in the summer. Um, Usually it's the older kids, that being our parents, playing, watching each other's play, cheering each other on and just having a great time. It turns out this made-up game is actually really fun. And as the summer progresses, another friend, Barney McCallum, joins in. He quickly gets hooked and even improves the game by making new paddles out of plywood. Gone are the old ping pong paddles. Barney's paddles are more durable and better suited for the game. The friends also decide to lower the badminton net to about hip height making it easier to volley the wiffle ball back and forth. This hybrid of tennis, badminton, and ping pong might be simple. But what started as just another backyard game is, in fact, the beginning of a sport that will one day take America by storm. This is the origin of pickleball. Hey everyone, it's Kavitha Davidson, your host, and welcome back to Sportly. Every week, we dive into sports history, spotlighting iconic events, remarkable athletes, and uncovering the lesser known yet impactful moments both on and off the field. Now you might have noticed that seemingly out of nowhere, everyone is either playing or talking about pickleball. It seems almost inescapable. I've noticed people on the bus carrying paddles, new courts sprouting up everywhere. There's even a giant pickleball tournament in Central Park. If you've been seeing the same things, or if you're a pickler yourself, you're not alone. 
And yes, apparently they are called picklers. In the years since COVID, pickleball has been ranked as the fastest growing sport in the U.S. The numbers show that this growth transcends age. Young college students are into it just as much as older folks in retirement. And celebrities are loving it, too. Tom Brady on a hunt for another title in pickleball. Leonardo DiCaprio, Jamie Foxx, George Clooney, Katy Perry, and even the Kardashians have all tried their hand and their paddle on the pickleball court. And thanks to all the hype, it's been featured on The Today Show, Good Morning America, CNBC, and BBC News as a sport to look out for. But how did this simple sport, made up one random summer day, become America's new favorite hobby? In today's episode, we'll dive into pickleball's brief history, how it's played, and how COVID contributed to the popularity it enjoys today. So let's pick up the story where we left off. We're back in 1965 with the Pritchard family and their friends on Bainbridge Island. Now that they've created this new hodgepodge of a game, there's the question of what to name it. The suggestion comes from Joel's wife, Joan Pritchard. She says that the game, made from scrap together materials, reminds her of a pickle boat. Now, in rowing, the term pickle boat describes a crew made up of leftover rowers from other boats. So the name sticks, and the game's pioneers call their new creation Pickleball. A few years later, the Pritchard family even names their dog Pickles, inspiring a rumor that's false that the game was named after the dog, rather than the other way around. Remarkably, the family holds on to their made-up game and continues to play it as the years go on. But what's more incredible is how the game's popularity grows beyond the Pritchard circle. Friends and neighbors catch on, especially after Joel's friend Bob builds his own pickleball court in his backyard. Now, there are a few reasons why pickleball seems to grow in the area after that. One, as a local politician who would end up eventually becoming a U.S. congressman, Joel probably knows a lot of people in high places, which could also explain how pickleball manages to spread outside his neighborhood. Two, it helps that the equipment is relatively easy to come by. And three, even the court itself doesn't require much space. Pickleball courts are much smaller than tennis courts, so people start drawing up courts with chalk in their driveways or at the dead ends of neighborhood streets. Anywhere there's a hard surface for the ball to bounce on will do. The game grows so much that by 1968, Joel and his friends lay the groundwork for an official corporation called Pickleball Inc. They trademark the name Pickleball, and this company begins manufacturing balls, paddles, and nets for others to use and enjoy. The game spreads across Washington State, eventually throughout the Pacific Northwest, and the nation. Ten years after the game's inception, the National Observer publishes an article on pickleball in 1975, announcing it as the Great Leveler. You see, the article notes that in pickleball, quote, victory doesn't favor the player who is fastest, tallest, brawniest, youngest, or even the most athletic. Soon after, Tennis Magazine writes a piece on America's newest racket sport, this growing buzz helps catapult pickleball to new heights. And now seems like a good time to explain how this sport actually works. Don't worry, I'll keep it simple, but the accessibility and the mechanics really do help us understand how this sport gets so popular. The basics we already know, right? It's played on a smaller badminton-sized court with small hard paddles and a plastic ball with holes. It can be played as a singles or doubles game, which means it's between either two or four people. One side begins with a serve over the net, which must bounce once on the court before the other team returns it. After the return ball bounces two, shots are a bit looser. Teams can now hit the ball back and forth before or after it bounces on the court. If you hit the ball before it bounces, this is called a volley. 
But there's one exception to the volley, and it's one crucial rule that keeps the game more about finesse and skill than power, speed, and athleticism, the non-volley zone. This part of the court is a marked portion on either side of the net, commonly known as the kitchen. Simply put, players can't volley while standing in the kitchen. They have to wait for the ball to bounce once. This keeps tall or especially aggressive players from dominating the game with sudden volleys that are difficult to defend. This sounds pretty appealing if you're someone who can't move as quickly, playing against a seasoned athlete. There are still, of course, ways to get out, like letting the ball bounce twice, hitting it out of bounds of the court, or hitting the ball into the net. In general, these faults will lead to the other team winning a point, with the goal of reaching 11 points with a margin of two. But everything from the smaller size of the court, which is more accessible, to the holes in the ball, which make it lighter and go slower, helps make the game more about strategy than just athleticism. So for those who aren't as physically fit or energetic, pickleball offers a welcoming alternative to more demanding sports like tennis. In 1976, the first formal pickleball tournament is held at an athletic club in Tukwila, Washington, just across the water from the Pritchard's summer home. There are reports that many of the competitors are reportedly college tennis players who haven't practiced with the proper pickleball equipment. And this tells you just how much of a fledgling sport this is at this time. Though pickleball is big enough to warrant a trademark and a tournament, it's still a niche sport with a relatively small pool of players. This will soon change, though, with one man named Sid Williams. Sid enters the pickleball scene in the early 1980s. At 46 years old, he's an accomplished racquetball player holding multiple senior masters and golden masters titles. And it depresses me that at 46 years old, he's won some senior titles. When he first learns about pickleball, he eyes the small paddle and plastic ball with skepticism. See, racquetball is a fast-paced game. The ball is heavy, and it flies through the air at up to 175 miles per hour. But the holes in a pickleball make it a much slower game, which initially strikes Sid as, in his words, wimpy. However, after giving it a try, Sid changes his tune. And sure, maybe it's not the most hardcore, but you do still have to be quick on your feet and reactive. By the end of his first game, he's sore for two days. That's that senior body. And he realizes that pickleball is no joke. It's actually a good workout. Sid grows to love the game. And by 1982, he's organizing tournaments and teaching others. In 1984, Sid co-founds the United States Amateur Pickleball Association, or USAPA, and becomes its first executive director and president. Associations like the USAPA are governing bodies that help spread and standardize the sport on a national level. What's most important about the USAPA is that it opens the doors for a boom in popularity and in formalized tournaments. From its founding through the mid-90s, the USAPA hosts about 10 to 15 tournaments a year. And by 1990, pickleball has been played in all 50 states. Pickleball's pioneers tried some obvious ways to capitalize on the sport's growing popularity. At some point during this 25-year journey, Joel and Barney even attempt to tap into the actual pickle industry. Actual pickles, like the kind that you'd put on pastrami. They explored some kind of promotional partnership, but it doesn't actually work out. Barney later recalls that all they got out of it was a five-gallon container of pickles to take to tournaments. Definitely not worth it. As we move further into the 2000s, pickleball courts bloom across the nation. By the time the USAPA hosts its first national tournament in 2009, it's already made a solid mark on pop culture with its debut on ABC's Good Morning America. 
The tournament, held in Buckeye, Arizona, draws 400 players from 26 states and even a few Canadian provinces. The USAPA continues to host this tournament annually, evolving over time. They eventually establish an international federation to help support the sport's growth worldwide, including in Canada, Europe, and Australia. Pickleball's next big change comes in 2021, thanks to COVID. Breaking news, stay at home. That is the order tonight from four state governors as the coronavirus pandemic spreads. New York, California, Illinois, and Connecticut. As I'm sure we all remember, the pandemic interrupted everyone's lives. And even after total lockdown, we were still social distancing and people were looking for ways to safely interact with others. Enter pickleball. True to its origins as a family-friendly sport born out of boredom, people across the country take up the game as a way to have fun while still staying six feet apart. And sure, tennis is also spacious and absolutely sees a participation boom thanks to COVID, but it's also classically known as a rich person's sport. The sheer space required for tennis courts is a luxury. But for pickleball, you can drop your own court in your driveway. At the end of the day, the same reasons it became popular in the 60s and 70s made it popular now. It's easy to learn, family-friendly, and accessible. Recreational pickleball continues expanding faster than ever before, with an estimated 36.5 million people trying the sport at least once from 2021 to 2022. In 2023, that number climbs to around 48 million, approximately 14% of the population of the United States. The average age of serious players, the picklers, has dropped from around 55 to 34, with the fastest growing group being those under 24 years old. So despite its reputation as a sport for retirees, clearly millennials and Gen Z are taking a liking to pickleball, as these New York City residents recount in an interview with Vox. Whenever we come out and it's actually nice weather, the entire ground is covered with pickleball courts. I live we're literally like right next door here and I just saw scores of people on the weekends and I just jumped in. Many will tell you it's a social sport, often played in teams of two. And because there's less distance between sides than on a tennis court, you're able to actually carry on conversations while you're playing. This aspect, combined with social media groups and pro teams to root for, draws in younger players. There's even a dating site for players called Pickleball Dating. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourselves, because my next guests are the champions of the world's first televised celebrity charity pickleball tournament, Pickled, which premiered tonight on CBS. Please welcome your champions to The Late Show, the Emmy Award-winning host of The Amazing Race, Phil Kogan, and multi-platinum country music star, Dirk Bentley. As the sport gains traction with the general public, it's also drawing the attention of celebrities who are eager to invest in its future. Athletes like LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Drew Brees, Tom Brady, Draymond Green, and Patrick Mahomes have invested in or bought parts of professional pickleball teams. Major League Pickleball has expanded to 24 teams competing in tournaments across various cities, with prize money likely to increase as the sport attracts more sponsors and investors. And Tom Brady even shared his enthusiasm for pickleball on Good Morning America, explaining why he believes in its potential. I've been trying to find a way to extend my professional sports career beyond my 40s, even into my 50s, 60s, 70s, as long as I can, right? And I think I got the answer. It seems like everyone else has the answer too. Pickleball. I love that it's become such a popular neighborhood sport. It's a great way to get out of the house, but I'm coming to win. I'm coming to dominate the sport. Other celebrities like Katy Perry are channeling their pickleball passion into philanthropy. In October 2023, Perry hosted the first annual Light Up the Court Pickleball Tournament at the Montecito Club in Santa Barbara, California. The event, attended by stars like Megan Trainer, Rob Lowe, Kate Hudson, and Orlando Bloom, benefited Perry's Firework Foundation, which empowers children from underserved communities through the arts.
Now, public parks are becoming pickleball playgrounds, and that's not without controversy. Tennis is a king or queen of all the racket sports, that's true, but tennis is endangered. And if we don't uh, do something about it, paddle, pickleball, they're going to convert all the tennis clubs into paddle and pickleball. In 2021, a shared set of courts in Santa Rosa, California, made headlines when pickleball courts were vandalized with motor oil, leaving the tennis courts untouched. A threatening letter was found at the scene warning picklers that their cars might be keyed if they returned. Officials were hesitant to speculate on motive, though they did note that there had recently been confrontations between local pickleball and tennis players, tennis players who resented the opening of new pickleball courts and characterized picklers as rich and entitled retirees. For nearby residents, the noise is the bigger issue. I wake up, I hear it. I walk down the steps, I hear it. It's as loud as a rock concert. The rigid paddle and hollow plastic ball make pickleball relatively loud, leading some areas to limit public play to certain hours or even ban it altogether. This was the case in Glendale, Colorado in 2023. Pickleball. Innocent exercise for some, but noisy nuisance for others. In Glendale, the city council just approved new rules after claims that pickleball players damage local tennis courts. Infinity Park in Glendale has long had tennis courts that were often empty before the pickleball explosion. Afterward, people brought their own nets to create makeshift pickleball courts. Over time, players racked up $100,000 in damage, prompting the city to ban picklers from the tennis court. However, the city then planned to build a dedicated pickleball court, joining the trend of new courts sprouting across America. In 2022, a Cincinnati park opened an 18-court public pickleball space, complete with three dual-lined courts for both pickleball and tennis, drawing more than 13,000 players that year. And in Raleigh, North Carolina, a developer invested $70 million in a pickleball complex, while in Florida, entrepreneurs invested $180 million in 15 private indoor pickleball clubs. Now, that's all really admirable. And when it comes to pickleball, I certainly don't begrudge older folks or folks with limited mobility from taking up any kind of physical activity. It's good and it's healthy. But as the game gains popularity, it seems to be becoming increasingly the purview of the rich. Magazines like Town & Country have published articles with headlines like How Pickleball Became the Preferred Sport of the 1%. And I think we have to ask why that is. Like with anything, there's obviously a financial aspect here. Replacing tennis and basketball courts with pickleball courts has become a common practice by club owners and real estate developers looking to maximize the value of their land. And it's one thing when you replace publicly accessible, affordable court space with other court space, but private pickleball court time is really expensive. And I do think it's kind of interesting that, again, while it's really good to get anybody who's sedentary moving, as Michelle Obama would say, it doesn't seem to be the highest level of physical activity. There was a study that the University of Manitoba put out a couple of years ago that said that an hour of pickleball gives you half as many steps as just an hour of walking. <laughs> but in the end, pickleball's widespread appeal is clearly tied to its physical accessibility. It's something that anyone can pick up and enjoy, regardless of their age or athleticism. If you're sedentary, the game's low impact nature makes it a great way to stay active without the risk of injury, although apparently people do get injured playing pickleball. And its simple rules mean that newcomers can start playing and even start winning on their very first day. If you're more active, maybe you should try some tennis. But the social aspect of doubles play also fosters camaraderie and community, ensuring that pickleball's popularity will only continue to grow, particularly as socialites in the Hamptons continue to see pickleball as a precursor to evening cocktails. Thanks so much for listening to Sportly. Sportly is an immigrantly media production. 
This episode was produced by Sadia Khan and Shay Yu. This episode was written by Michaela Strother, Shay Yu, and me, Kavitha Davidson. Our sound designer and editor is Paroma Chakravarti. Our theme music was created by Simon Hutchinson. Other music by Epidemic Sound. Tune back in next week and every week for more Sportly. Thank you.